Um, so the, this next talk is going to be essentially almost the opposite of what you've had this morning. Um, Professor White's been giving you a lot of um, theoretical background to what snakes are, how their venoms work. This talk is going to be much more orientated on how you assess snake bite and how you manage snake bite. A much, the, or, the target of this talk is pragmatic um, rather than theoretical. Now, I realise that a lot of you have a lot of experience with managing snake bite and have seen many snake bites already. So forgive me if some of this seems simplistic to some of you. But one of the things that we need to do, or you need to do in Myanmar, is to try and make sure that everybody in your country is unified in the way that they assess a snake bite and the way they manage a snake bite. Um, because it is only when you have a lot of doctors doing the same thing and recording the results of that intervention that you can then look at what is happening and make sense of that information. Um, and by making sense of it, I mean analyse what is happening to the hundreds and hundreds of patients you're seeing every year um, and deciding which bits of your management work and which bits of your management maybe don't work. Um, at the moment, as is the case in many countries, we have lots of doctors doing things their own way. And the problem with that um, is it makes it very difficult to assess responses to treatment adequately. Um, before we go on to this talk though, did any questions come up whilst you were having your lunch that you thought you might like myself or um, Professor White to address now? If not, we can move on. We can always answer them later. Now, um, what we are doing in assessing snake bite is not looking to diagnose snake bite. Your patient has turned up to your hospital and told you they have a snake bite. We know this already. What we are trying to do is to differentiate the patient with snake bite who is envenomed from the patient with snake bite who is not envenomed. The patient with envenomation needs treatment and antivenom. The patient who is not envenomed does not need antivenom. So your history, examination, analytical testing is all designed to differentiate those two groups of patients. Okay, and like assessing any other thing, assessing snake bite for envenomation involves taking a good history and then recording what you have obtained in your history in the notes so that the next doctor that sees the patients knows what you have already found. And if you are transferring the patient from your hospital to another hospital, making sure that that information goes with the patient so that the doctor who receives the patient at the other end in this case here in Mandalay General Hospital, doesn't have to start again and guess what you did, they know. So taking a good history is important, writing down your good history is equally important. That information must be available to everybody to make sure the patient gets good care. Your examination should be targeted at trying to detect the sorts of problems that Professor White has highlighted this morning. You know that snake bite causes hemorrhage, so you should look for hemorrhage. You know that it causes neurotoxicity, so you should look for neurotoxicity. So this is a targeted examination looking specifically for findings of envenomation. Analytical tests, similarly, you have a history that makes you either suspect or not suspect the patient is envenomed. You have an examination which also tells you yes or no, you think the patient is envenomed or not, not envenomed. And then you do a couple of small tests to confirm that opinion. You don't need to do lots and lots of tests, but small tests like the whole blood clotting time are very important to help your decision making. Again, equally important that you record the results of these tests and make them available to the next doctor involved with the patient's care. Management of the envenoming can be broken down into some broad picture topics. First aid, managing the bite site, the use of antivenom and the delivery of supportive care and we'll talk about those things. So again, I can't stress this enough, taking a good history is very important and recording your good history is equally important. Um, the keys to uh, your history are that you are aiming to try and assess the likelihood of the patient being envenomed um, and predict the time course over which you expect that envenomation to resolve, evolve, sorry, not resolve. Um, the sorts of things which are key to forming those impressions are knowing what time the bite occurred what the patient did 
after that bite, obviously physically, physical exertion and walking a long way to medical care means that your muscles are contracting, your, your lymphatic system is being pumped, venom is being spread around the bloodstream. Okay? Um, we need to know if first aid was applied and what type of first aid that was, what time that was instigated and not ideally what the patient was doing between the bite and when that first aid was applied. And we need to know what sorts of symptoms the patient has developed. Abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, whether they're reporting bleeding. These things are important to your assessment of whether you think venom is in the bloodstream or not. Now if you are receiving a patient from another health facility, you also need to find out what was done at that first health facility. Specifically, was antivenom given? And if antivenom was given, what type was it? What time was it, was, was it given at? Was there a complication to that treatment or not? Fluid balance, we've heard that um, capillary leak and pulmonary edema is a big problem. Um, very difficult to manage and one of the keys to assessing your management of shock and you're assessing your management of the volume status of your patient is knowing what therapies were given prior to arrival at your health facility. So did the patient get given fluids? Um, we know some centres use diuretics routinely, so we need to know if this patient received diuretics. Some centres are fluid restricting patients. We need to know if this patient was fluid restricted. So you need to form some sort of impression about where you think your patient's volume status is at the point at which you're assessing them. Examination. So this is not a, a blind look at the patient. This is a look at the patient bearing in mind what Professor White has told you about the mechanisms of venom toxicity in a person and then directly looking for those events in the person. So we know that Professor White has told us that venoms cause neurotoxicity and that tends to be a descending paralysis. So examine your patient's cranial nerves um, and specifically examine the motor components of those nerves looking to see where there is any evidence of involvement there. We know that they can cause embarrassment of respiratory function so we must look at the patient's tidal volume and see whether they look to be generating decent inspiratory and inexpiratory excursion and we must examine their intercostal muscle strength and their diaphragm and make sure that these muscle groups are intact. We should look at the peripheral nervous system for signs of weakness. We need to look for haemorrhage and specifically that means examining the mucosa where sometimes you will find a cold bleeding and looking at the bite site and any cannulation sites on the patient. We know that there are phospholipase A2 toxins in the venom which will attack muscles and tissues. So we should look at the bite site and the muscle groups and see whether there is any evidence of tissue destruction there. And examine the lymph nodes in the draining region. So if you bite bitten on the foot, you must examine the nodes in the groin, see if they are swollen and tender because this will tell you the venom is now in those lymph nodes, not just in the bite site. Again, we know capillary leak is a problem, so we must directly look for this. We look at the conjunctiva and see if they are swollen and edematous, and you must listen to the lungs and see if your patient is developing pulmonary edema. Again, if you find these things, you must record them in the notes so the next doctor knows they were there when you saw them, or not there and have developed in the intervening period. You must assess the hemodynamics of your patient. Feel them, see if they're cold or warm, check the pulse rate, see if it's normal or fast, check the blood pressure. Ideally, um, it would be very useful for you to be weighing your patients over time if you have this facility available to you. As patients who develop renal failure, assessing their volume status is very important and is very strongly guided by what their weight is doing each day. So the aim of your examination is to identify the bite site, identify whether there is end organ toxicity, so envenomation, and to make a clinical diagnosis of envenoming. And if you make a clinical diagnosis of envenoming, then you give antivenom. So we'll just have a look now at one of your doctors examining for some of these issues. You can see the doctor here assessing for ptosis. Now, ideally what you need to do is to take that gaze superiorly and hold it there for a period of time. If you do it very quickly, you may not see the ptosis, but the muscles fatigue, so if you hold the patient's gaze upwards over a period of time, you may detect subtle ptosis that you would otherwise miss. Then you check the um, lateral gaze looking for ophthalmoplegia. So again, checking for ptosis and looking in lateral gaze for ophthalmoplegia. 
It's also important to examine eye function more globally, looking for normal pupillary constriction, checking the visual acuity, which may indicate bleeding at the back of the eye or in the occipital lobes. And ideally, if you have access to it, doing a fund fundoscopy to see whether there are retinal or posterior vitreous hemorrhages. I appreciate that these are not always available and that doing that in a, a lit ward can be very, very difficult. We then need to assess the other cranial nerves. Now, in this sort of situation, you can afford to be targeted about which cranial nerves you are examining. You're not particularly interested in checking their auditory acuity and doing a Weber's and a Weber's and a Rene's test and uh, testing, checking the vestibular nerve. What you need to know is, is this patient developing an ascending toxicity, so ascending paralysis. So what this doctor is doing here is specifically examining the motor components of the cranial nerves. And reassuringly, this man has good facial movements. He has strong facial movements. This movement he is doing now tells you that his airway is fine. You don't need to support his airway. He has good tone in his pharynx and his jaw. He can protrude his tongue. Anyone that can protrude their tongue doesn't need to be intubated. This is all very reassuring. So you target your examination of the cranial nerves to an assessment of the motor component of those nerves. The next thing you do is assess for the strength of the neck musculature. And this is very easy. Turn your head left in opposition and check the, the muscle strength as you do that. In the same way, we check for the broken neck sign. And this is, I think this man actually has a broken neck, which is not, not such a good thing. Normally, if you can lift somebody up by the shoulders, they will take their head with them, okay? If they can't do that, that makes you concerned that perhaps there is some weakness in the neck musculature there. Get your patient to sit up. And this might seem a bit of an odd thing to ask, but what this tells you is that the abdominal muscles are intact, the intercostal muscles are intact, and so the, the chest wall mechanisms of respiration are working. And check for the diaphragm. So put your hand on your patient's abdomen through the, through the respiratory cycle, and what you should be feeling is when the patient is breathing in, your hand on the belly is going up. And these things are things which should be done when the patient comes in and then each hour if you're thinking the patient has a cobra bite you'll be going back and examining the patient again and repeating these things with the idea of detecting changes and detecting neurotoxicity as it develops. And this is why it is very important for you to record what you find. If you have a normal examination and then you go on a break and one of your friends comes and examines the patients and finds that they now they have some ptosis but you haven't written it was normal an hour ago it may be missed that this is new and that this is an indication for antivenom now. Once you have completed your history and examination, it is time for some targeted tests to confirm or, um, or refute your su suspicion the patient might be envenomed. And really this in your setting comes down to the whole blood clotting time. Now this is not a test that you are doing to assess the patient's clotting ability, really. What you're doing is using this test to tell you whether you think there is venom in the bloodstream. Okay, so it's, it's a subtly different concept, but what you are doing is using a non-clotting result as a suggestion that there is venom in the bloodstream and therefore a reason to give anti-venom. Most of the time, that assessment will be accurate. Sometimes it might not be but this is the best we have. Look, formal testing with INR or APTT or D-dimers and fibrinogen levels, which is the, our approach to the same issue in Australia, um, is used in exactly the same way. The, the numbers we generate aren't necessarily the main thing. The abnormality is used to, to infer the presence of venom in the serum. So it's not important that you do an INR, versus a whole blood clotting time, it is just important that you assess the patient's clotting ability. In some patients, other tests might be useful, like a urinalysis to detect the development of um, proteinuria, or a urea or creatinine, or both preferably, in a patient whose urine output is starting to reduce to see where there is a developing kidney injury there. And a CK, if you have access to that, to see whether you think the patient has rhabdomyolysis. But the, you, I appreciate that these tests aren't available everywhere um, and they should be used relatively selectively.
the aim of these tests is to diagnose occult envenoming. You will find some patients who look well, examine normally, but have an abnormal whole blood clotting time. These patients still need anti-venom. It is also testing is also used to develop the evolution of um, end organ toxicities and progressing toxicity. Now it's very important again that we are all doing the whole blood clotting time in the same way. And the reason that this is important is that it would be the ideal thing for your country to evaluate whether this test is a good test or not. Now, to do that, you need to know if everybody is doing the test the same way, and you need to have all the test results recorded, and you need to have good patient information in the notes so that you can then look back over time and say, the whole blood clotting time result was <coughs> non-clotting, we gave antivenom, patient got better, and analyze the results over time. So it is very important that you standardize the way you do this test. Um, the way that this is ideally done is to put around two, three mils of blood into a clean glass container. It has to be glass. Plastic won't activate the clotting cascade, so it will give you a falsely abnormal test result. Um, you need to then leave the blood in that container for 20 minutes, and the timing is also important. If you leave it there for not 20 minutes, then you may well get a, a false result, a t a blood in that has not had time to clot and a false negative. If you leave it for too long, the clot may actually start to break down and again give you a false result. So here we have um, some video footage of an ideal way to do this test. This doctor is using a, a cleaned antibiotic vial, which is fine. Um, we will be giving today to all of the um, district hospitals some, some glass syringes to, to take with you. So the doctor has put around two mils into that vial, put a stopper on it, and has then started the timer. So this way she knows that this is going to be 20 minutes, the alarm's going to go off and she'll come back to have a look. Now our time is up, she's come back, and that is a negative result. So that is clotting, reassuring. So now she's going to come back in an hour and do it again. Conversely, we'll now see her checking a positive result, and she's tipped the vial, the blood has run down the side, there's clearly no clot there. That is a non-clotting result. Um, now sometimes you'll get a clot in the, in the vial and some of the, the serum will run away, and that is still a clotting result. But if the blood flows freely like that, it is, it is clearly non-clotting. So if we have got a patient with snake bite, what should we do about it? Now, the first thing that needs to be done, and usually this will be done before the patient arrives at your hospital, is, is apply appropriate first aid. And the aim of the first aid is to trap the venom in the limb and stop it spreading into the systemic circulation and causing secondary effects like renal failure. Um, theoretically, your venom can't cause renal failure if it's not in the bloodstream and it's trapped in the foot. So this is the rationale behind first, first aid. The method that has been described by Tun Pei and others in your, in your country is to apply a um, bandage over the bite site and then a firm compression bandage designed to occlude the lymphatics but not the blood flow to the limb and then to immobilise the limb so that there is no muscle contraction when the patient is moved around from place A to place B. It's important to look after the, the bite site. It is a wound. Most of your patients with a snake bite will have in, incurred that snake bite in a, in a field or an environment where there is exposure to dirt and, and other objects and it, it is a contaminated wound. So it needs to be cleaned and the patient needs to have appropriate um, tetanus prophylaxis if, they, if they're not already tetanus immune. It's not ideal to give a tetanus booster while the patient is coagulopathic, however. So you need to wait for that to resolve. The question of antibiotics um, prophylactically is a, a little bit of a vexed one. I appreciate that it is very common in your country to give, uh, to give antibiotics routinely to patients um, for wound care. Its preventative role is unclear, but that is, that is fine. Now we will be talking in a bit more detail about antivenom 
later. Um, Professor White will be giving you another talk on that after this, so I won't dwell on it. But antivenom, um, just to give you a, a quick picture, is obviously a mixture of antibodies to snake venom proteins that are harvested usually from horses, sometimes sheep, um, post exposure to a snake venom. So they are snake specific. Antivenom to cobra will not work for Russell's viper and vice versa. Um, similarly, the, where the venom comes from is probably important. So uh, a Russell's viper venom from India used to immunise a horse will not necessarily work very well for a Russell's viper bite in, in your country. And that may also be re more relevant just in terms of your own country and where the venom is sourced regionally within the country. So the venom, antivenom binds to venom proteins um, and those complexes are then destroyed by phagocytes and the reticuloendothelial system within your body and the top the combinations are removed. So who needs antivenom? Now we don't give antivenom for snake bite, we give antivenom for envenoming. Okay, so we have taken a history, we've done an examination, we have done some analytical tests to differentiate the envenomed from the non-envenomed patient. Um, envenoming may be indicated by local findings or by systemic findings or by tests. So the clinical, the local indications for antivenom administration include massive or progressing swelling, so swelling that is already very impressive or swelling that is marching up the affected limb quickly, that is an indication for antivenom. Tender lymph nodes in the draining area, that is also an indication for antivenom. Systemic uh, examination findings that are indicative of a need for antivenom include spontaneous bleeding, neurotoxicity, hypotension and shock, severe renal angle pain, or developing renal failure represented by oliguria and urea. And the analytical tests which indicate a need for antivenom uh, include non-clotting blood obviously with a whole blood clotting time or the new development of heavy proteinuria. So this is what your national protocol give you as the indications for giving antivenom to your patients. How much do we give? Well, we all know, I'm sure you all know, that the recommended dose is, is 80 mils, eight vials of uh, Russell's Viper antivenom uh, for Russell's Viper and, and four vials or 40 mils of Cobra for Cobra bites. Now, why? The, the way that that was arrived at was by milking snakes, and by milking snakes we mean holding their mouth open and putting their fangs over a dish and seeing how much venom they squirt into the dish. Now that results in a spread of venom weights, um, but the peak venom weight, the maximum was thought to be about 75 milligrams dry weight. So we know that from neutralization studies that your antivenom, will, one mil of your antivenom will neutralize one milligram of venom, and therefore to give yourself a little bit of leeway, the dose was defined as 80 mils, to neutralize 80 milligrams of venom. So for most, the vast majority of your patients, that should be enough. There may be the occasional patient who, who has more than that, more venom than that, who may need more. There may be some patients who don't have that much venom and you've given more than you need, but th that is okay. So 80 mils, eight vials is the recommended dose. In terms of how you give it, the recommendation is that you start slowly and that is so that you can you have an opportunity to detect any adverse reactions that might occur but if the patient is tolerating the infusion and has no adverse reaction then you should aim to get the antivenom in quickly um, there is no evidence that slowing the infusion rate down um, from that point on reduces the chances of them having an adverse effect so you should aim to get the antivenom into your patient within 20 minutes of starting the infusion. Now there are complications to antivenom use and they can be divided into early complications and late complications. And the early complications, these are complications that occur in the first couple of hours after administration, can be divided into pyrogenic reactions and allergic or anaphylactic reactions. So the pyrogenic reactions are caused by impurities and endotoxins in the fluid that you're administering. And they cause um, release of um, cytokines and inflammatory mediators which result in fever, 
tachycardia, low blood pressure, um, but they do not cause the other features of allergic reactions such as swelling of the, the mouth and the pharynx and the, and the airway or bronchospasm and wheeze. So these are pyrogenic reactions and these are managed by giving the patient fluids, bringing their temperature down with some paracetamol or some ibuprofen or something of that nature, but these patients don't need um, adrenaline or antibiotics or steroids. Um, this is a, a endotoxin mediated pathology that usually settles reasonably quickly on its own. Anaphylaxis on the other hand, um, this is a, an allergy to the horse derived proteins uh, in the antivenom. This is associated with urticaria, bronchospasm, edema of the pharynx and the mouth and the, and the tongue, lips etc and hypotension. And these patients need fluids and steroid, steroids and may well require um, inotropes such as adrenaline. There also, there's also potential for late complications. Um, now these occur at about days four to 10 post exposure um, and are caused by the deposition of immune complexes, antibody antigen complexes. So the antivenom and venom complexes can be deposited, deposited throughout the body and the places that they are deposited in can generate an, an inflammatory response. The sorts of places that this tends to occur is in the skin, causing a rash, in um, synovial fluids, causing arthritis, and typically in the small joints of the hands and the feet. It can also occur, occur in lymph nodes, causing lymphadenopathy, or spleen, causing splenomegaly, um, and occasionally in the kidneys, causing a, a late onset glomerulonephritis. Um, these sorts of responses tend to of complications tend to respond well to steroids um, and you can use antihistamines as well for symptomatic relief if you need to. Some patients may require more than one dose of antivenom um, and it can be a difficult thing to try and determine who needs to have a repeat dose of antivenom. And this is because we have no test to tell you whether there is still venom in the bloodstream or not. So you need to guess basically based on what is happening to your patient. So we tend to infer that the antivenom is working if the patient is feeling better um, and their symptoms are improving. If the initial indication for giving the antivenom has gone away and resolved itself. Um, or if the things that we can measure such as the clotting tests have become normal and we tend to infer that the antivenom has not worked and the patient requires more if the patient is getting worse or if there is significant ongoing hemorrhage or if the, the clotting tests fail to normalise at six hours. So the indications for repeat dosing of antivenom within your national protocol are cl clinical deterioration, ongoing severe bleeding, or failure to normalise a clotting test at six hours post antivenom. If the patient needs more antivenom, the dose is the same, 80 mils um, for the Russell's Viper. So we'll move away from direct management of the envenomation now and talk a little bit about supportive care in general because this is as important as the treatment of the envenomation itself. Um, now we've said cobras and crates can be associated with neurotoxicity and, and with the loss of airway protection, muscle tone and respiratory muscle function and respiration. If you detect this early, the antivenom may stop it progressing. Um, but if it is already established, then you need to support the patient's ventilation until they recover. And if there is presynaptic neurotoxicity, that may take days to weeks to recover. So this is difficult. Um, there are a number of ways that you can do this. You can simply use a bag and a mask and ventilate the patient, or you can use a supraglottic airway like a laryngeal mask which doesn't require any particular skill to insert um, or you can intubate the patient and put them on a ventilator. Now what you do it depends on what your skill set is and, and what you know, infrastructure and support is available in the hospital that you are working in um, but it's worth and very important to bear in mind that if you do these things the patient will survive even if they have established devastating paralysis, apnea, and non-ventilating, if you do these things the patient will live. Um, 
So it, it is a difficult thing to do in a resource challenged environment, um, but we need to try and find a way to deliver this uh, supportive care to our patients. Shock is obviously a big problem in this patient group. Um, now shock may develop for a variety of reasons. It may develop due to volume depletion in a patient who has environmental dehydration if they've been working outside or giving a lecture. I think we're all environmentally <laughs> volume depleted at the moment. A lot of the patient, these patients have vomiting or, and may lose volume in that way as well, um, or hemorrhage, volume depletion from that. Um, they may have myocardial suppression as a consequence of either a direct venom effect or coronary thrombosis mediated myocardial ischemia or they may have a vasodilatory distributive form of shock such as can occur with anaphylaxis or sepsis. So we need to try and assess our patients to see which one of these physiological abnormalities is the main problem and this involves looking at their skin and assessing their skin turgor, looking at their mucous membranes, looking at the JVP, assessing the pulse volume etc to try and determine what you think the primary physiological abnormality is. And what you do about it should be directed at what you think the primary problem is. We need to make sure that our patients have an adequate, adequate circulating intravascular volume without being overloaded um, and that they have an adequate circulating haemoglobin as well. Um, and if their hypotension persists despite normalising those two things, then they need ionotropic support, which all sounds very easy, but I appreciate it is not. Yeah. We need to try and normalise our patient's clotting and to achieve hemorrhage control if the patient is actively bleeding for, from any venipuncture or, or bite sites. Um, and this requires administration of antivenom and the consideration of clotting factors and platelets if hemorrhage persists. Which brings us to what do we do about the coagulopathy itself? Should we administer clotting factors and platelets or should we not and here you can divide the patients into two groups there are patients who have uh, coagulopathy so non-clotting blood but no hemorrhage or just a little bit from bite sites and cannula sites but no major hemorrhage these patients don't need clotting factors and platelets what they need is to have no injections into muscles and to not fall over and bang their head so we just look after these patients, know that they are coagulopathic and try and prevent secondary injuries, but these patients do not need clotting factors or platelets. And then there's another group of patients who do have significant hemorrhage, and that may be external or into the gastrointestinal tract, or it might be intracranial. Um, the treatment of this is with an adequate neutralizing dose of antivenom, um, correction of the things we can correct, such as hypovolemia, hypoxia, hypotension. It's a good resuscitative care, and these patients do need clotting factors and platelet replacement. Um, I think it's debatable what you should actually be targeting, and, and I think you know, in our own practice in Australia, we're a little bit spoilt in terms of being able to regularly measure things like the platelet count and the fibrinogen levels and, and so on to target active endpoints that is going to be difficult in your environment and, and you'll need to administer what you feel is an adequate dose of the, the blood products and monitor the clinical response to that. Now there's going to be obviously a significant patient group, maybe 30% who develop renal failure and, and renal impairment and may require dialysis. Um, Dr. Chanel Pei will be giving a talk on this specific component, so I won't dwell on this or expand on it now. I think probably the important thing for those of you who are working um, in the regional hospitals is to know which patients you should be transferring. Okay, And the patients you should be transferring are the ones that you think are developing renal failure. And it would be sensible to transfer these patients before they become anuric and volume overloaded because that is a difficult patient to transfer. The mortality rate in a patient with volume overload and hyperkalemia will be very high. Many of these patients will die on the road from your hospital to another hospital. But if you get that same patient 10 hours earlier when they are oliguric or have some renal angle pain, they will, they will survive. 
So the key for those of you in regional hospitals is to try and pick the patient who's developing renal failure and transfer them before it becomes established. So impending renal failure is it suggested by things like severe renal angle pain, frank hematuria, new development of a heavy proteinuria, oliguria obviously, and if you have the capacity to measure either a ure urea or a creatinine, a, a trend that is rising in one of those variables. And I'll leave the rest of uh, the management of renal failure to uh, Chanal when he arrives. So the, in summary, just to recap, the di we are trying to diagnose envenoming rather than snake bite. It is like anything else. The components of a, of a diagnosis are very simply the history, the examination, and a few targeted analytical tests. Um, it is important that you do those things thoroughly and that you record the results of your findings in the patient's notes or in the transfer letter to make the information available to your colleagues who are managing the patient subsequently. Management, we must pay attention to first aid, bite site care, appropriate administration of a sensible dose of antivenom and monitoring of the response and complications to that and the delivery of good supportive care. Okay, so there's no rocket science in any of that. This is just good basic medicine. But do any of you have any questions that you'd like to ask me about any of this component?